Thank you, Katie. So um, we're here at the uh, mostly on virtual for the the uh, forest update meeting and with the uh, ag joint ag meeting, the Senate and the House Ag committees are together. And Kayla, when you get a chance, go ahead and call roll as people are able to log on if they haven't already. Go ahead and, and add them, please. Kayla, I think you need to unmute. <laughs> Senator, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Bouchard. Excused. Senator French. Here. Senator Cost. Present. Senator Wasserberger. Excused. Representative Blackburn. Here. Representative Clausen. Here. Representative Fortner. Here. Oh, there you are. Hi, Bill. Hi. Representative Heiner. Here. Representative Larson. Here. Representative Western. Here. Representative Worf. Excuse. Representative Winter. Here. Co-Chairman Boner. Here. And Co-Chairman Eklund. Here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you noted, we can leave the attendance open as additional legislators join the meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, so our first order of business will be um, a message from our state forester, Bill Krapser. Bill, are you logged in? Yes, sir, I am. Well, go ahead and proceed when you're ready. Okay, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Joint Ag Committee. Um, you have a lot of new members on the committee, so I'm gonna do something a little different, give you more of an overview of, of everything we do and, and focus on our forest health. Uh, my name's Bill Crapser. I'm the Wyoming State Forester. Uh, it's been my privilege to be your state forester for the last 17 and a half years. Annually, we have this meeting to update you on forest health, forest management, and wildfire issues facing the state. Uh, with me today, I have Tammy Angel, who's the um, acting regional forester for Region 2, Jackie Buchanan, who's the deputy regional forester for Region 2 for the U.S. Forest Service, and Mary Farnsworth, who's the acting regional forester for Region 4. They also have several of their staff on the uh, Zoom today to answer any questions you may have. Um, Mr. Chairman, before I start, I do, I do want to praise Representative Blackburn. Uh, that's a great background that you have. Uh, as a forester, we can greatly appreciate it. Um, Mr. Chairman, with, with your permission, I'll go over a few of the issues, kind of an overview of state forestry and some of the forest health issues facing the state. And then I'll turn it over to the Forest Service to talk about Forest Service uh, specific issues. From, from the early TIHAC days on, forest products industry has played an important role both economically and for the growth of our state. Starting with the reductions in timber harvest that we saw in the 1990s, we've seen a large decrease in the industry. Today we have only three remaining large sawmills in the state, South and Jones in Evanston, Saratoga Forest Management in Saratoga, and Devil's Tower Forest Products in Hewlett. There are also several small mills, some post and pole operations, and there's been a few attempts to get some biomass operations running in the state. The demise of the forest products industry has not only had a large economic impact on several of our smaller communities, but it's also detrimental to our abilities to manage the forests. Simply put, the industry is one of the main tools available to cost effectively put management on the ground. We need to look at every opportunity to support the industry we have left 
and to make sure they stay viable. Over the last 15 years, as, as most of you know, about half the forest in our state have been impacted by either mountain pine beetle or spruce bark beetle. The 2020 growth in acres of mountain pine beetle was extremely small and spruce bark beetle only expanded, expanded by a few acres. So the, the uh, epidemic of the bark beetle is kind of passed, we're in one of those troughs. The main challenge facing us with bark beetle um, today is recovery and fuels mitigation. Um, most of these areas are now heavy blowdown and the fuel loading and fire potential is very high. We saw that this last summer and fall with the Mullen fire on the Medicine Bow National Forest. Western spruce budworm is currently probably the most significant emerging forest health issue in the state. The insects a defoliator that impacts Douglas fir. In 2019, over 169,000 acres of the state were impacted by the budworm. State forestry is working closely with the BLM and the US Forest Service on several projects attempting to slow the spread of budworm in the Southern Bighorns and around the Medbow. Probably the most visible uh, budworm project we have going, if you drive between Cheyenne and Laramie on the interstate as you drop down Telephone Canyon, that south side of the interstate is a piece of state trust land, mostly dug fir, very heavily impacted by spruce budworm. This last summer, we uh, tried to do a thinning from below. We took, under, took out the understory that had been heavily impacted, uh, chunked up and piled the slash from that, that operation. The goal is to let the larger mature trees try to recover with less uh, competition from the understory. Uh, it looks good. We're really hopeful it's gonna work, but with things like spruce budworm, um, We'll, we'll be able to safely tell you in a couple of years whether the, whether the project was a success or not. Uh, we're also seeing in the eastern part of our state what we're calling ponderosa pine mortality. We've seen die off of ponderosa pine in isolated pockets, uh, particularly hard hit up in the Guernsey area, a few areas in the Pole Mountain area where you'll see a lot of orange uh, dying ponderosa pine. Uh, we believe it's a combination of the uh, late freeze last spring that we had after sap was running and some twig beetles. Um, it is an isolated instances, but we are pretty concerned about it and trying to figure out the best course of action on that. We're also seeing several invasive inse insects coming into the state. We're closely uh, monitoring emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is an invasive from Asia uh, it's pretty much decimated all the ash trees in the eastern United States and in the Midwest. Um, it has been found in Fort Collins, so we are expecting that we will start seeing it in Wyoming at some point in time. We are doing a lot of trapping in towns to see if, we're, uh, if we have any indication of emerald ash borer. It's an important issue for us because of the amount of ash in a lot of our communities. Uh, Powell, for example, 41% of the trees within the town limits of Powell are ash, and the emerald ash borer would pretty much decimate the uh, tree population in Powell. Douglas, about half the trees in the town of Douglas are ash. So um, it's, it is an important thing, and I, excuse me, I didn't mean half a quarter of the trees in the town of Douglas are, are ash, so it would be a, a huge impact to that town as well. Uh, we have seen, uh, balsam woody adalgia. We're looking for that, especially out in the western part of the state. It, in, it impacts the true firs. It has been found in Montana, Utah, and Idaho. So I think it's only a matter of time. Uh, we're working closely with the Forest Service monitoring uh, some of those issues to see if we're, we are seeing a spread within the state. Uh, the Japanese beetle, which is an invasive that attacks not only ornamental trees, but agricultural crop, um, crops has been found and um, is in the town of Sheridan or the city of Sheridan. Uh, they're working closely to try to eradicate it within uh, the city limits. Right now, it is an isolated population. We don't think it's a sustainable population, but it easily could gain a lot of traction. Last summer, Governor Gordon signed a shared stewardship agreement with the Secretary of Agriculture. The agreement, along with our newly updated forest action plan, lays the framework for us to work closer with the Forest Service and other partners 
on cross-boundary projects across the state. Utilizing federal good neighbor authority, coupled with the good neighbor account that the legislature passed last session, we've greatly increased the pace of GNA projects across the state. Currently, we have 17 project-specific agreements with the Forest Service and BLM, including timber sales, thinning projects, and fuel reduction projects. The Bighorn National Forest and the Black Hills National Forest are each funding a seasonal GNA forester position to help further develop these projects. In fact, we have uh, the money commitment from the Black Hills for our, our seasonal forester and have that position advertised right now. Um, in this, in addition to shared uh, partnership forester that we have with the Medicine Bow National Forest, working with the Council of Western State Foresters and the Forest Service, the Forest Service has funded a good neighbor coordinator for the state that we uh, are working closely trying to move the good neighbor projects forward. 2020 was a very busy fire season for Wyoming and much of the West. We had over 1,050 reported fires um, during last year. A very disturbing note is we've seen over the last 10 years a huge increase in human caused fires. About uh, well over 70% of the fires we saw, saw last summer were human caused. Early in the year, we collectively agreed with our federal partners that in a time of COVID, rapid initial response was the best strategy for this year. With the mo for the most part, this, uh, this strategy was very successful. While we had several large fires, the Mullen Fire on the Medicine Bow National Forest was the only fire in the state last summer where we had to bring in a large incident management team to manage it. The Mullen Fire did get relatively large at 176,000 acres, making it the largest fire in Wyoming since the Yellowstone fires of 1988. To assist in rapid initial attack, state forestry for the first time ever had two single engineer tankers or seats under contract that we based at the BLM tanker base in Casper last summer. These seats responded to over 55, or to 55 fires over the course of the summer. We estimate that the seats save the state and our federal partners several million dollars in avoided suppression costs. One of the best examples was right out of Casper, the center of Casper Mountain, uh, the Garden Creek area. We had a real nasty uh, fire start there in a real inaccessible area. And with utilizing the seats and our state hell attack, we were able to, the BLM crews, city of Casper and county crews were able to catch it. Um, but we couldn't have made it work without our federal partners. The BLM uh, let us use the, the tanker base in Casper. They staffed it for us. Their support was invaluable as was the forest services in uh, interagency cooperation. Our state how attack also had its very successful 17th year flying on 47 fires along with assisting them two search and rescues. Again, our program couldn't be successful without our federal partners. The Medicine Bow uh, National Forest actually brings people to the game and our hell attack uh, and about approximately half of our hell attack firefighters are Forest Service employees uh, that I know of were the only state aviation program in the country where we routinely have federal partners riding, on our, riding in our aircraft day in, day out. Uh, it, I think it's a testament to the way we've been able to work together and make that work. Two years ago, the legislature gave us the authority to serve, lack of a better term, as the bank for county firefighters going out on federal or out-of-state assignments. Uh, when county firefighters send people out. Bill, you muted on us somehow. We can't hear you. Did I mute? Am I back? There, you're back on. No, okay. Okay. I must have been leaning back in my chair too far, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. Right. Okay. Uh, when, when county folks go out on fires, uh, in the past, what they had to do, if they go out of state on fires, they had to prepare their bill. They had to send it to us to be audited. We send it back to them. They'd send it on to the Forest Service it, or to the BLM. It took months for the counties, for the folks that went out to get paid with uh, the action the legislature took two years ago, we're able to now pay the counties and then we bill the Forest Service or the BLM. It's made the system one way more efficient 
And two, the concern I had was we were getting a lot of county folks who just, just weren't willing to participate anymore. Uh, this last year, we had over 400 people, county individuals who went out on assignments. So uh, we're really building the capacity of our counties, therefore of the state with this program. And I applaud the legislature for moving forward and letting us do that. Uh, in closing, I think we, not, we always have to look at opportunities to work with our federal partners, the industry and the public to increase the pace and scale of forest, fuels and invasive species management on the landscape. If we have any hope at all to get a handle on forest health and fire issues facing not only Wyoming, but the West as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my prepared remarks. Uh, at your pleasure, I will either introduce uh, Tammy Angel to start off for the Forest Service or answer any questions from the committee, however you want to handle it. Well, we'll start with questions from the committee or, or I'm not seeing any. Oh, now I do. Go ahead, Representative Clausen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Crabster, what do you think the biggest barriers to entry is as far as uh, the timber industry, as far as manufacturing goes? Is, is there a lack of financing? Is, is there just a general squash of the industry? I mean, uh, when, we, when we look at, uh, you know, the direction of how to get, get uh, some of these places cleaned up a little better, a, a vibrant tim timber industry kind of seems to be the key. Uh, do you see uh, just in general barriers to entry? Mr. Chairman, Representative Clawson, I, I think it's it's multifaceted um, with, with the reductions in timber that we saw during the 1990s and into the early 2000s, a lot of mills closed, uh, a lot of the competitive nature of the industry shifted as far as where focus is. Um, the, the simple answer is timber supply, timber supply, timber supply. If there's wood available, uh, market merchantable wood available. Folks in the uh, industry, like the people running uh, Devil's Tower Forest Products or Saratoga or um, um, the mill out in Evanston, they can make it work. Um, the bark beetle epidemic, I think was a, was a double whammy as far as the industry goes, because that wood has a limited shelf life and a lot of that bug kill wood is, is meeting the end of its shelf life. Uh, we have had some industries that have tried some biomass. We've had a bio, biochar uh, plant in Laramie. Uh, we've had a lot of small nibbling around the edges. The, the problem gets down to the economics of what's available and, and trying to make it work. We've also seen a lot of, I think, international changes in forest products markets and where wood comes from that impacts it. So, um, the, the simple answer is wood supply, wood supply, wood supply, but there's, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, I think where I'm focused right now, Representative, is what we need to do to retain and make the existing industry we have more vibrant to help us move forward, both economically and management-wise. We do have a couple more questions. I, I guess you were... <laughs> kinder than I would have been, Mr. Crapser, concerning the timber supply. Um, I'd fill the committee and I think it was the mid nineties that uh, the federal government quit putting out uh, leases on federal forces, forest service leases and timber sales. And that's a supply that went away. We were unable to manage the pine beetles. So they became a huge problem. And I guess for the, for the, the uh, folks that are going to be testifying with the Forest Service, I have in the back of your mind maybe some answers for us on what we might be able to change that atmosphere. Um, a little history I'd give you, I graduated from high school in 1970, and the logging industry in Wyoming was the third largest industry. And it's, uh, yeah, I don't know where it is now, but uh, for a time, the only viable timber industry was in the Northeast, and those were all private forests. And the other part of that is that the only healthy forest we had five years ago and up until to date was the Northeast. And 
And other than a few pockets of federal land, it was pretty clean and free of, of pine beetles because we could manage them. But I guess I would, I would like to uh, get some input from our federal people while they're here on how we might be able to change that, um, rearrange the partnership back to what it was if, if possible. We've got a couple more questions. Uh, Representative Fortner, go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is with this program, uh, state contribute in their part, what's that cost in the, the working people of, of Wyoming? Are, are we ahead of the game or behind the game? I know we're, I know the whole point is to keep people working in the logging industry, but as other citizens foot in the bill for that, thank you. Mr. Chairman, Representative Fortner, by, um, I, I assume you're talking about the Good Neighbor Program and what we're doing working with the Forest Service and BLM uh, on doing work on federal lands? Yes, sir. Um, that program, the way uh, you all set the, the program up, the account with, the, with uh, the legislature that we have and how we're working with the Forest Service, those positions that we're talking about are all federally funded positions. So um, we, we, of course, you know, from, from my oversight and some of my staff's oversight, there are, I, I can't tell you, there's no, no state dollars involved in it. But as far as how we're doing the Good Neighbor Authority projects, how those uh, foresters are being hired, how we're administering them, we're utilizing entirely federal dollars to do that. So if the federal dollars goes away, are we going to continue on or, or are we going to discontinue the program? Thank you. Bill, we're not hearing you. You might still be muted. Go ahead when you're I'm ready. I'm not sure what's happening with my mic. Okay. Am I back with you? Okay. Yeah, you're back. Um, Representative Fortner, Right now, the way the, the program is set, set up, as I said, we uh, are utilizing federal dollars to help leverage work on their ground. Um, if those federal dollars go away, we have no way to, we would, we would have no way to sustain the program or still do the program. Thank you. Representative Heiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, appreciate this. I, what a wonderful conversation we're having about our forests in the state of Wyoming. And I appreciate all that, uh, that we're trying to do to keep this industry alive and, and multiple use. But Mr. Krapser, I've been very closely affiliated with some of these small uh, uh, sawmills. My father-in-law owns one here on the west side of the state. And I can see that the turmoil they are in trying to get uh, supply, like you mentioned before. In fact, it's it's a whenever he would get a load of logs in, it was it was like Christmas, because he was so excited to get a load of logs in, and I've noticed that throughout the, the the decades here, there's there you know we we try to keep these small businesses in operation, but the supply is, has its ups and downs, and that's what's driven most of these small uh, sawmills out of business is lack of supply. And, and as we change administrations on a federal level, it seems like there's a vast difference when we could a, can access the, the, the timber products and when we cannot, it get, we get excluded from this. So for a, a small business owner to develop a sawmill or something that is based upon these lumber products, they, they, they don't have the consistency or the stability of a, a market plan because of the supply. So what can we do as a state of Wyoming to open up the, the access to our national forests in a prudent manner, in a responsive, responsible manner, so, such that we can have a consistent supply chain for these small businesses to succeed. Mr. Chairman, Representative Heiner, I, um, I wish I had a great answer to your, your question. Uh, partially, that's what we're trying to do, working with the Forest Service with shared stewardship and with the Good Neighbor Authority. Um, to, to back up just a minute with the Good Neighbor Authority, when we do a project on federal land, a timber sale per se, under Good Neighbor Authority, we utilize a state contract, we administer the sale, um, and, and, we kinda, and we can move forward. We also, any, um, 
I'm trying to think of the word they're using, retained receipts, as far as over minimum bid, uh, those dollars go into our account to be used for other federal land projects. So um, it's an attempt to try to do exactly what you're saying, to smooth out that supply, whether the whether the supply is huge or small, the, the issue that a lot of small operators have, you're absolutely right, uh, is consistency and knowing what they can expect one year from another. So uh, we are working on it. I know um, our, our congressional delegation, I got several emails today from our congressional delegation asking me for some ideas for some forestry reform legislation they're working on. So they're working on it from that side uh, also. So I. Hopefully that answered your question. And I also just wanted, if I can, Mr. Chairman, to jump back real quick to uh, Representative Fortner's question. Um, the utilizing the good neighbor, besides the federally funded foresters that we are gonna be able to use, Representative Fortner, when our regular folks go back, go out and work on good neighbor stuff, we actually charge that, those costs to the project. So, um, in some respects, we do save general fund money by utilizing, by doing the good neighbor projects because we get some, some dollars refunded from our regular staff also. Follow up, Thank Mr. You. Chairman? Yeah, go ahead. So we, we, we visited a little bit about, uh, you know, managing the forests and, and your, your good neighbor program, Mr. Cresper, but uh, what do you feel like we have adequate voice in the management of these federal forests? Are we at the table with our federal partners and do we, are we able to participate in that manage, those management decisions or are we forced to uh, accept whatever comes down from, from Washington? Mr. Chairman, Representative Heiner, that, you know, when you get into uh, NEPA or the, the National Environmental Policy Act uh, and, and different directions that different administrations or anything go, there's, there's a lot of still pressure from Washington. But I think um, in the 17 years I've been doing this, I feel we as a state are in the best position working with our federal partners than we ever have been as far as being able to use through shared stewardship, good neighbor, and just the relationships that we've built between the federal agencies and ours, I think we have more input than we've ever had before in projects. It's, is it a total panacea? Do we have the solve, problem solved? No, but I think we're making way more progress than we have, quite frankly, any time in my career. Well, that's good news, except when you were a logger, maybe. <laughs> Uh, so uh, if we could have a little education within the national forest, we have a, uh, a few sections of state land, correct? Yes, sir. Have, has anybody researched what it would take to um, develop timber sales within those sections and try to, try to uh, I guess, establish a, Re-establish a, a viable logging industry in different areas, Mr. Chairman. Uh, statewide, as far as state trust land goes, we uh, we have of the 3.6 million acres of state trust land, only about 270 thousand of it have trees on it, and really only about 120 thousand uh, acres of state land is what I would call productive timberland, where you can actually manage timber, have timber sales, and, um, and on a sustainable, or not even on a sustainable basis, but have them grow back, regenerate, and be able to manage for timber. Um, during the 90s, when the Forest Service program took a dive, the state hit their, section, hit their lands really hard. Um, we continue to have an active timber sale program on our acreage, but, um, our forested acres are scattered enough across the state. They're a good, I think the, the industry guys would tell you that what we're able to provide to the market is a good add on to where, what they can get from federal lands and private lands, but we don't have enough land or enough timber to actually have, have make a mill sustainable. Okay. So both are needed federal and state lands. So uh, Chairman 
Boner, I believe that's you up there. Go ahead when you're ready. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I'd just like to point out to the committee, this is something that another uh, committee of the legislature, the Select Natural Resource Management Committee has been uh, discussing over the interim. And I can even send a, uh, a letter that we sent to our congressional delegation at the beginning of last month um, uh, de uh, dealing with this topic. Um, and uh, uh, so we just so we're not uh, treading over any any ground that's already been turned over, and it's certainly something that that uh, select committee is going to be discussing in, into the future. Um, I've noticed a, a stark difference, just in my personal opinion, have been involved with that committee for a few years, and the uh, openness and the the way in which Forest Services cooperated with us, it's been really refreshing. Um, there's still some uh, issues that are outstanding, some differences of opinion, but it, it has been a, a significant amount of progress. I can only hope that uh, that um, openness to uh, discussing these issues with state and local officials will continue into the future. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and send out that letter to everybody. We have contacted our counterparts in South Dakota as well, since they're going to be um, uh, affected as well as dealing specifically with the Black Hills National Forest. Um, so um, uh, I, I just uh, to change the subject a little bit here, Mr. Krabster, uh, can you give us more of an update on the uh, Hell Attack unit, you know, my, my favorite part of your division, um, right there just south of Glen Rock. Uh, there have been some issues with the infrastructure there, and I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, you didn't mention it today, I just want to make sure that's behind us. Mr. Chairman, Co-Chairman Co -chairman Boner, uh, I wouldn't say it's behind us. Uh, for, for those of you who aren't aware, housing that we have there, uh, the facilities we have there are some FEMA trailers that we got about 10 years ago, uh, mobile homes, and put them in place. Um, as always with FEMA trailers, we started a couple of years ago having a lot of maintenance problems, mold problems, that sort of thing. Um, Center Boner was involved in, in looking at some options for us. Um, what I'll say, Senator, is we've, we've got rid of the mold. We've got the trailers kind of patched back together and they're good for a couple more years, but long-term it's still an issue we're going to need to deal with at some point in time. Thank you. Uh, we have another question either from Representative Larson or Representative Winter, whoever, whoever, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Representative Larson. Um, in your report, uh, Director, you mentioned the Mosque land purchase or something, and I just kind of wanted an update on that and what that entailed. Uh, I see there's like 4,300 acres, and uh, is that for uh, forest uh, timber uh, issues? And uh, I saw there was other partners and a total price of 11 and a half million and what the state put into it. Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, the Mosque par uh, property is up in Crook County in the Black Hills. It's the old Homestake Mining Company lands. Uh, about 15 years ago, the legislature looked at buying the entire uh, Homestake uh, properties. That didn't happen. Um, we had an opportunity. This is what, for anybody familiar with the area, it's what they call the Grand Canyon of the Black Hills. It's the, the canyon that runs uh, south of Sundance uh, up through the Black Hills. It's very productive grazing. It's very productive timberland. A couple of years ago, we were able to uh, apply for what's called a forest legacy grant. It's a grant from the U.S. Forest Service to help either do conservation easements or to purchase uh, forested land. We worked really close with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, with the National Wild Turkey Federation, and with the Nature Conservancy. Um, we did get the grant for $6 million of the purchase price. Other partners, the Elk Foundation, I know Cabela's was involved in it, put in a little bit of money. Uh, then we did, a as the land, land board would do, uh, and the Office of State Lands would do, they did a full acquisition assessment as far as potential rate of return uh, on the investment and the land board through their um, fund that they have that they, they can could use for purchase some, some land a year ago put in, I think believe it was about four and a half million of the final to get to the $11 million. So 
Um, it's basically a piece, it's now state trust land. We also have a legacy uh, because the feds put in a well over half of the purchase price. We have a um, legacy management plan on it, but we are moving forward. The um, land office is moving forward with grazing leases. We are looking at timber sales on it. And um, I, I believe overall, it's, it's a good investment. It's great recreation ground. It does also open up some access to the Forest Service lands. Thank you. That was interesting. Okay. Yeah, if you were to look at a map and follow Sand Creek down from Sundance, it pretty much that creek goes right to an old town that I guess was a mining camp then called Mosky, and it used to be on the map. I'm not sure it is anymore. No one lives there, but it's, it's really beautiful. It eventually ends up a two track and comes out, I think on 85. Mm -hmm. So you can go straight through, but it, um, I've fly fished the area and it was really, really a nice area. Um, good to have more timberlands, I think, to harvest. Uh, so I think, oh, there, we've got, Another question, Representative Fortner. Thank you, Chairman. Hey, uh, Representative Western has been wanting to make a comment for quite a while. I think he finally gave up on us, but uh, we can go ahead and hear from him now if that would be all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Sorry, Representative Western, your background is almost yellow or something. I, I did not see the hand. Or oh, don't don't go ahead. Go ahead and holler. Um, don't uh, nobody so. hesitate to holler at me if you need to talk. So go ahead, Cyrus. No, I don't worry. I appreciate that. No, I guess my question was for Mr. Casper. Uh, for a lot of the forests that have been hit by um, your emerald ash borer or some of those other worms or, uh, or, or bugs, is there any kind of marketable use for for some of that timber? That bad timber. Obviously, it's no longer good for for normal lumber, but is there any kind of secondary market or use for it or any, uh, any way it could be considered marketable timber in at least some sense? Mr. Chairman, Representative Western, um, the, the mountain pine beetle areas, um, we're, we're continually amazed how long the lodgepole pine is still merchantable for saw logs. Uh, the Saratoga mill is running off of uh, lodgepole pine that's actually been dead now for about nine or 10 years. So it's, it's amazing how long that they're actually um, being able to survive off that. After that, there are, there are some people that have been trying to do biochar. There are some people that have been looking at potential pellet mills. There's, there's lots of ideas. The problem when you start looking at the, what I would call lower value, secondary biomass products, it all comes down to economics and the cost of uh, harvesting that wood, moving it to any facility, at least to date, costs more to get it there than, it, than you're going to uh, be able to return making it into something. So it's, uh, that's the problem. If we could come up with the, if we could come up with the solution to that, um, the Forest Service folks and, and I would all be on some uh, tropical island bringing in our stock dividends on what, what we'd figured out. But uh, it is an ongoing problem. We're always looking at new ideas and, and anything anybody, uh, any thoughts anybody has, we try to look at them. It's, it's easy to, it's the economics are so tight, it's easy to get jaded on it. And we, we try not to and always look at any opportunities people have as far as if it would really work. Thank you. Representative Fortner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if this is a, a question to ask at this time or, or more towards the end of the, the meeting. Uh, I see that they, they have uh, planned 17 more purchases, uh, two of them in the elk migration areas, uh, corridors of the Teton County. Uh, I'm sort of like uh, Representative Arson. How much of this is coming coming out of the taxpayer's pocket? Mr. Chairman, Representative Fortner, are you talking about 
look at state land purchases or the Jackson uh, study they did on the state land in Jackson? I'm not familiar with, with what you're talking about, I guess. Yeah, it relates to the forest legacy programs for the, the state purchased with the, with the federal government. The same thing you did over in Mosque. It looked to me like according to the literature we got. Okay, the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, now I know what you're talking about. Those are actually uh, conservation easements that the state, we would probably, Game and Fish would probably be the holder of them. And they would be done with legacy, which is federal funds, and with um, uh, other partners' funds. There wouldn't be any state funds. We right now we don't invest. We don't invest any state money. Uh, at least my agency doesn't in any uh, conservation easements. Thank you. We're we're more the facilitator of putting the parties together for those pro those projects. Okay, thank you, Mr. Crapser. We, <clears throat> so I think, I'm not seeing any hands raised or any more questions. Um, I think we're ready for the acting regional forester from region two to talk. Uh, Tammy Angel, Mrs. Angel, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Chairman Boner, Chairman Eklund and members of the committee. Good afternoon, I am Tammy Angel and I am currently the Acting Regional Forester for the Rocky Mountain Region of the USDA Forest Service. Thank you for today's opportunity to come before the Wyoming Agriculture, State and Public Lands and Water Resources Joint Committee. I am honored to have public land management responsibilities across Wyoming and I appreciate the close working relationship we have with you, your constituents and the county commissioners. It is a pleasure to be here with my colleagues, and I also want to thank State Forester Bill Crapser for inviting us to today's briefing. Also joining me today are Russ Bacon, Leslie Crossland, mm -hmm. Lisa Tibchek, Andrew Johnson, Jeff Tomac, and Jerry Kruger, Forest and Deputy Forest Supervisors for the Medicine Bow Route and Thunder Basin National Grassland, Shoshone, Bighorn, and Black Hills National Forests. Steve Lord, our Director of Renewable Resources, and Sandy Underhill, our state liaison, are also with us here today. Next, I would like to introduce Jackie Buchanan, our Deputy Regional Forester for the Rocky Mountain Region, who will provide an update on our ongoing forest management work across the state of Wyoming. So Jackie. Mrs. Buchanan, I, I guess when you're ready to go, I, go ahead. Well, you know, I was going, but I had myself muted. <laughs> so I yeah. apologize for that. I had started. Um, Chairman uh, Eklund, Chairman, Co-Chairman uh, Bonner, and uh, members of the committee, thank you so much for having us here today. Um, we it, This is a very important opportunity for us, and we recognize uh, it, it's a chance for us to share some important information with you and let you ask some questions. Uh, as you know, I think most of you know, in Wyoming, the Rocky Mountain region oversees the management of the Bighorn National Forest, the Medicine Bow National Forest, uh, the Shoshone, and parts of the Black Hills, as well as uh, Thunder Basin grasslands. So that's the area that we have responsibility for out of the Denver office. So let me begin today um, talking about restoration, resiliency, and shared stewardship. And, and looking back a little bit at the 2020 uh, wildfire season. Um, what a year, right? Uh, 2020 um, was a, a challenging year for all of us. Uh, we have all had to be much more nimble in the face of this pandemic, worldwide pandemic, um, which caused all of us to change the way that we do business on, on a daily basis. Um, we've been operating in this virtual world, but our commitment to continuing the critical work that we have um, to do in front of us, the priorities that, that we've set jointly with our partners, um, we've continued to work at, uh, but, it, but it has been challenging. Um, and, and then we, uh, not just with the pandemic, but we had uh, one of the worst fire seasons we've had both nationally um, and for sure in this region, uh, and even impacting Wyoming as, as well as Colorado. So um, let's talk about that fire season. 
we had over 60 days at what we call preparedness level five here in the Rocky Mountain region. That's the highest level we have. That means that it is all hands out, um, as, serious as, as serious as it gets. Uh, and that in my time, and I've been operating between uh, region four and region two for 12 years now, uh, we've never had anything that came close to that. Um, and that of course included the Mullen fire. You heard uh, Bill Crapser talk about that. Uh, 100, almost 177,000 acres uh, next to the Yellowstone fires of 88. Um, it, it was, you know, the most impactful that any of us have seen. Um, well, the 2020 fire season is behind us. There's still a lot of work to do in just recovering from that. Um, Post-fire recovery, restoration work, you know, continue to be a priority for us, um, both for the region and the Medbow National Forest in particular. Uh, the Mullen fire impacted a lot of acres. We were talking about the timber program and options that we had. Uh, the Mullen fire impacted uh, quite a bit of area in that lava project um, management area. And uh, I think we had seven timber sales that were already prepped and ready to go to be sold in the first quarter of 2021, um, about 20 million board feet. And the, that fire impacted uh, those sales and um, impacted our ability to move that wood. Now we're trying to do what we can um, in, in regard to still uh, removing what wood has value, but that, that was a pretty hard impact for us. Um, we, we basically have three phases of fire recovery. So there's the fire suppression repair. That's, you know, after the bulldozers have been through, after the lines have been in, we have to fix that. So that's, you know, that's one piece of work that we do. Um, the emergency stabilization, which is very critical, um, as you all recognize, on the ground, especially for the watersheds, you know, to, to just ensure that there's not the sediment in the soils going into those critical watersheds um, and impacting that in a negative way. And then um, what we can do to stabilize through the burned area emergency response work, the bear work that uh, I think most of you have heard us talk about through the years of that right after the fire, um, what can we do to stabilize that ground, you know, and for a host of things. So those are the three phases and that's part of the work that we're gonna have to do continuing in um, to, into 2021. Uh, I'm happy to report that some of that is already underway. I mean, we started doing some of that work while the fires were still burning, um, but it's gonna take us a while. And, and I'm not sure, pretty sure actually, that we won't get through all of that even in 2021. Um, one of it, one of the issues continues to be is just having even enough money um, to do what we need to on the ground. Um, but I'd like to reiterate, uh, I am really proud of the shared effort that we had with our firefighters, with with the folks that that Bill, um, he and his team worked with us closely, and all the cooperators, because um, with all the challenges we had in dealing with the pandemic, um, we still came through that season without any serious injuries. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the forest products and the fuel uh, fuels program um, here in the Rocky Mountain region, particularly in Wyoming. Um, and Wyoming plays an important part for us. Uh, Wyoming genuinely, generally contributes between 20, 25% of our regional uh, target accomplishment, both uh, for timber and for fuels. Um, we recognize the importance, as you have all said, um, throughout the conversation earlier of the economic importance of that timber program um, for those operators that are out there for the mills and the communities that those mills are in. Um, so we, we recognize that is significant. Um, and despite the challenges that we had in 2020, uh, we, we didn't meet our target. You know, honestly, we didn't uh, regionally, but, but we came um, pretty close. And what Wyoming uh, actually contributed to the overall program was about 42 million board feet came out of Wyoming for timber. Um, and that's out of about 225 million board feet that we had regionally. Um, and we got very close on our fuels uh, target accomplishment uh, for the region. We hit about 92%, which given everything else we were dealing with is pretty significant. And of course, the importance of the fuels work is that, that you know, that gives us a chance to stop those fires to be able to deal with them in a way that they don't grow um, to the significance that Mullen and some of those other fires uh, did this year. Um, 
and and I think actually in Wyoming we hit a hundred percent of our of our fuels target uh, regionally we hit the ninety two percent in Wyoming we hit a um, hundred percent so so that speaks volumes to those folks that were continuing tr to try to work on that. Um, let's see. Uh, in the careful placement of treatments on the landscape, as I said, um, not only affects the vegetation, but it really does help. Uh, the mall, when we speak to that mall and fire, I think it bumped into a number of our previous fuels treatments, about 200 tre treatment units, I think that fire uh, bumped into. And as hard as, as impactive as that fire was, it probably would have been far worse if we had not had some of that treatment on the landscape. And that was treatment that was that you've heard Bill speak to uh, that we've worked jointly um, with our partners across Wyoming on. So um, very important indeed. Uh, so let's talk a little bit um, about, uh, despite the challenging times, this wonderful uh, partnership um, relationship uh, opportunity that we have in Wyoming that's been long-standing and continues to strengthen as, as Bill said. Um, to talk about a couple of uh, just examples of that, on the Bighorn National Forest, um, the Sheridan Municipal Watershed Project, uh, you know, the very thing we're talking about, that it's designed to reduce and um, minimize that risk from fire, and uh, we're working closely with Wyoming Game and Fish on that, and, and the Division of Forestry. And so it's, it's a, part, a well rounded partnership. Um, and we're hoping to have that decision out in uh, December of 21. Uh, the Bear Lodge Ranger District on the Black Hills uh, is currently working with Wyoming State Forestry on the Wonder Timber Sale, which is a joint chiefs project. So we have NRCS also in the mix. Um, and NRCS is a great partner. Uh, Astrid Martinez is um, wonderful to work with. They bring some money into the onto the table into these projects, um, and it it just helps us have that much more capacity um, to do this critical work that we've all focused on. Um, and and the the great thing is, as Bill was saying, you know, this being able to share money with the state um, through Bill's department, uh, they're doing a lot of this work on the ground. We would not have the ability to do it otherwise, and and so it's a it's a real win win. Um, and it, it helps the state, it helps Bill's organization, and it helps us get that critical work done. So very, um, very important. Uh, in addition to our forest restoration projects, we provide funds, as Bill said, to the Cooperative Forestry Program, and that helps the state um, meet the goals in the Wyoming Forest Action Plan to conserve, protect, and enhance uh, working forests. In our 2020, um, in 2020, our investment totaled, I think, about 2.7 million, uh, and this this included about 736,000 for uh, four hazardous fuels reduction projects in Albany, Con uh, Converse, and Sheridan counties. And the state again will be working uh, with those landowners in the counties to treat the fuels on the private lands because. We all know um, fire and these beetles or, or whatever, they don't recognize boundaries, right? They don't, they don't look at federal land and say, well, we're only gonna operate on federal land. So we've got to treat both sides of the fence. Um, so, so we have a lot of good things in play and we'll continue to do that, that work around those um, shared commitments. So let's talk about 2021. Um, we are still continuing to deal with COVID. Um, you all know that. And, and the fire recovery, as I talked about, we've got to uh, restore and repair some of the damage from the fire, like Mullen fire. And so we'll continue. It's a balancing act between moving forward into our program, normal program of work and doing uh, the recovery work uh, from the fires. Uh, we, haven't, we have identified several priorities for this year. Um, which is around the vegetation management program and continuing to support uh, the, those operators and, and get, that, um, get the trees removed off the landscape and, and do what we can to reduce the fire risk. Uh, but, you know, we're dealing with COVID. We're still trying to figure out how that's going to look and what we're going to be able to do. So we're committed, um, completely committed, to uh, doing everything we can to meet our mm -hmm. obligations. And, and I say obligations very seriously um, and we'll continue to work with Bill. So in conclusion, um, the National Forest in Wyoming 
provides many benefits to the people of this country and to that great state of Wyoming. We recognize that there is much work to be done and we will continue to do what we can to increase the pace and scale of forest management activities by working across jurisdictions, leveraging those partnerships with Bill and Wyoming Game and Fish and NRCS and all the other folks that have a, a stake in the game um, and, and, and we'll do our part. Uh, so Chairman Eklund, Co-Chairman uh, Bonner, and members of the committee, um, I uh, thank you for accepting our prepared remarks. We look forward to continuing the positive, um, strong relationship we have across the state of Wyoming. Uh, and I welcome any questions um, or comments from you, uh, the chairman, or the committee at this time. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Buchanan. Um, so we do have a question from our House Majority Floor Leader, Albert Somers. Go ahead, Albert. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, thank you. And my, <clears throat> my apologies for not being in the right attire in your meeting. Um, so my question, uh, and it could be for Jackie or, or anybody, it's more on some grazing questions rather than, than, uh, than forestry forested questions. First of all, I'd like to thank the Forest Service for all their hard work on the fires we had and, uh, and, and Bill as well. Thank you for the last season. I haven't had a chance to say that, but uh, we really do in Wyoming appreciate your efforts. So my question is, is right now that you're in the middle of comment, the comment period for the rangeland management directives updates. My concern is because we have now changed administrations that what are some very good ideas for cleaning up very old regulations are gonna get stuffed back under the covers. And so that's my question. Are we still gonna honestly go forward with this in an honest review of, of this? To me, you have some really, um, really great proposals and, uh, and many of them are just minor fixes. One of them to me is a, is a major fix. And that is that you're going to, it seems like, honestly, take a look at the issue of allotment retirements and whether you're going to allow a third party to come in and purchase an allotment, basically purchase those rights, and then, and then that allotment be retired really without any, without a NEPA process. That's what's happened in the past. Frankly, that's happened multiple times in the past. And it looks like you're at least starting to address that issue. So my first question, are you still gonna go forward? And two, that specific issue, is that still gonna, are you still gonna have a chance of, of making headway on that? Uh, chairman? Yeah, so you're the right person to answer Hi. that, Mrs. Buchanan, and if so, go ahead. If not, then okay. help us out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No range does fall within my uh, realm of responsibility. So, and and uh, Representative Summers and I have worked together for many years. We actually had a meeting earlier, um, Albert. I mean, rep <laughs> sorry, Representative Summers. Um, I apologize for that. We had a meeting earlier with Jim McGagna and the stock growers, wool growers, um, and went over actually the the whole thing with the directives and the range management handbook. And so we are going forward. Um, we, they've actually extended the public comment and we shared that this morning till uh, through April 17th, I believe is the deadline. But we expect, fully expect that it will continue. We have done a lot of good work, uh, Rep Representative Summers, you are 100% correct and we don't wanna lose that. Um, we believe that there will be support for that. Um, now it has to go through the process and with the extension, for the public comment, I urge everybody, as we did this morning, um, to make sure you do comment on it and and what you like about it and, and what you don't like about it, because it's important to hear, you know, um, both sides of of that topic. Um, but but we fully expect Rep Representative Summers um, that that there will be a continuation, and uh, hopefully by the end of 2021, we will be able to to get all of that settled and, uh, and in place. Mr. Chairman, do, could I have one more question? Go ahead. You bet, Go ahead, Albert. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and Jackie, thank you for that. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that you guys are pushing forward. I know you probably have to, but I'm just hoping there really is an honest attempt at, at some reforms here. Really not reforms, just cleanups. But I mean, things that help family ranches, right? The way you change the name of corporations, the, how you look at families that have conservation easements and multiple family members can still have grazing permits. There's a lot of really good things that you guys have, have taken a look at. Um, you know, so the other question I have, and it's kind of my perpetual gripe on the Forest Service, and I'm just wondering what you folks are doing is you've kind of failed on the whole NEPA process. You know, it's, it's become almost impossible. I know you're getting a, you know, you finally got a timber sale up in my area, but in general, it's been extremely difficult for the Forest Service to even engage in NEPA to do projects of any kind, EAs, CEs, EISs. And so things have just fallen behind, fallen behind. We have a forest plan in, in the Bridger Teton that is, what, 40 years? I mean, I can remember as a you know a young man that be, being in on that whole deal, that's gotta be 40 years ago. And so what are you folks gonna do to actually improve your NEPA process to, to get work done and not just be afraid of the next lawsuit from Western watersheds? Uh, rep if I may. Yeah, Chair go ahead, Ms. Buchanan. <laughs> Sorry, Chairman. Uh, Representative Summers, um, I agree with you 100%. I, you know, we've had the conversations over the year. I agree with you. And, and I think many, many folks within the agency and, and the department um, have the same, same understanding and the need for some change around um, NEPA and how, how, how we move through it and what's the appropriate level and doing what we need to do, but not doing a whole lot of, of stuff, you know, that doesn't make it any better um, than if we didn't. And so, you know, we're in a, with the change of administration, they, there's a, a, a pause right now because they just want to look at what we had in motion. But the whole uh, EADM, the, the process that we had set up to revise and to adjust um, the NEPA process, look at more CEs, especially on the range side, um, Representative Summers, we, we have quite a bit uh, focused in, in that range world about making it reasonable and timely and being able to, to make important decisions in a, in a timeline that doesn't take years and years and years. And so again, we believe, especially with the range side of it, that we stand a very high probability of being able to continue to move um, all of that forward. And, and so, you know, the new administration needs to take a little time to just understand that, but we believe that it, it's not hugely controversial on, on that side. And I mean, will we, will there, where, will there be folks, sorry, I can't even speak right now, that will challenge it? Probably, but they always are, are there. And, uh, and it's the same group uh, that we would expect, same groups that we would expect. But, but we feel pretty strongly that we'll get that through. We'll have uh, additional CEs to utilize, streamline processes. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we agree with you, Representative Summers, and, uh, and we'll continue to do our part because we believe it's the right thing to do to get those changes in place. And then Mr. Chairman, I have one final grazing question and then I'll get out of, out of uh, everybody's hair. You know, that's fine. Majority floor leader, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and Jackie, so probably my last gripe, and it really revolves around not updating the forest plan in a timely manner. What happens is you end up with policy that's 40 years old driving the future, and that cannot happen. And, and on the grazing side, I just think of uh, grazing standards, let's call them guidelines, standards, whatever. You know, we went through an 18 year process to get an EIS in, our, in the upper green on our upper green cattle allotment. And placed in that document was standards that I believe, you know, just in all honesty are in violation with the forest plan. I, I don't think they're bad standards, but you have gone so far beyond the, you know, that plan is so dated 
that I don't believe you have a good connection even in your manuals to get to where you need to be with grazing. And so I just hope before you make any more grazing decisions in region four, and I'm, you know, I, I don't know if there's anybody there on region four, yes. but okay, good. Who can I look at? Uh oh, Mary. All right, region four. So, you know, you guys have got to do a better job. If you have an expectation on grazers that's more current than the Bridger Teton Forest Plan, you need to update it. You need to have those conversations in the public. We have a right to comment. And I just don't believe that's happening. And, and it's for the bad of the land, right? I mean, it's, in the end, it's for the detriment of the, of the land and the people around us. So I just really encourage you to get this thing updated. Get going on it. Don't, don't drag your feet anymore. Thank you, Mr. Majority. Floor Leader, I appreciate what you brought to this meeting. Uh, I was unaware that there were grazers in Wyoming that had lost allotments due to whatever lawsuits or whatever were brought forward. Um, if that has happened in Wyoming, I think the Ag Committee would be interested in hearing about it at some point in time. Um, do what we can to help. I know it's happened west of us. Uh, so before Ms. Mrs. Angel, Ms. Buchanan leaves, I guess something I'd like to bring to light, uh, how do you pay for these fires? Well, you sell more timbers and you use these resources to make some money. You can, if there's any way you can drive that to Washington, D.C., we'd appreciate it. I think it'd be a benefit to the state of Wyoming. Um, the the, you talked about the treatments to the land and, and, and areas of the fires that were minimal because those treatments were there, not minimal, they were it was still huge in the Mullen fire. One of them is, is forest management, thinning of trees, cleaning of the forest, um, the grazing management, all of those, all those are fire uh, reduction practices well-known ones too. And I don't think it'd be just Wyoming that would like to send the message. Half the coast of California burned up. People lost their homes. Um, massive fires that just seem to me shouldn't be happening if we were managing the, the forest as well as we could. So I guess, are you finished Mrs. Buchanan? Yes, sir. I, I can be. I just want to say thank you, um, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, and, and I agree and, and fully uh, support what you just said. Um, I think all of our probably all of our folks that are on the call today um, recognize that we need to continue to try to do more. Um, if, you're, if we can make some money off the timber and put money back into the reserves for use, of course, that is uh, a prudent thing to do and a wise thing to do. Um, and so we'll, we'll continue to work on that. And, uh, and we recognize the importance of our um, timber industry because they, they really are a critical partner for us to be able to do this work. And so um, appreciate the support of Wyoming and appreciate the opportunity to be uh, before all of you today. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate the work you do for us. All right. So I think the, the next, um, well, I guess with Mrs. Angel's permission, I guess, do we go to Mary Farnsworth? She's acting regional forester in region four. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we have a question up in Powell, maybe. Oh, we've got a question. Go ahead, fellas. There you go. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Representative Winter. Uh, my question is uh, directed to the three foresters there we have on our program today. Uh, it appears that at least two of them are working from home. And I wonder if, um, if they are, or if they could tell us what they're doing to try to uh, get things at least sort of back to normal where we can visit with the foresters and the uh, uh, rangers that are in our area. Uh, we can't even get into the offices now and, and I just don't think it's, it's good for business. Uh, so I would uh, like to hear something about uh, from the folks as to what they're planning to do, if they can do anything, and if there's anything we can do to promote uh, per in-person 
meetings, I, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Winter. Is anybody prepared to answer? Mr. Chairman, I can certainly address that. Go ahead, thank you. Um, so our chief of the Forest Service has asked that all facilities be in the gating phase, which is pretty much maximizing telework for all of our facilities across the whole Forest Service. And that's partly in response to the increases in numbers that we saw over the holidays, but also to reflect President Biden's 100 days that he has asked for all of us to give him for uh, maximizing our awareness and protections for COVID. So we are staying in gating in our region for sure for at least the next couple of weeks. And then we're going to slowly start modeling what our communities are doing a little bit more and we'll get slowly into our reopening, but it's gonna take some time. And in the interim, we are for the most part uh, teleworking and we are able to work in the forest for the folks who are uh, site workers and field workers are certainly able to get out. But for the most part, we are working from our homes. I think all three of us on the camera right now are, maybe even more of us on the camera are working from our homes. And if there is a need to, uh, access an office, we can certainly do that. And I believe there are phone numbers that we have available on all of our sites for folks to call so they can arrange for an appointment. So that's where we're at. And this is coming down from the, the top. USDA supports us and has asked us to do this as well. So that is what it looks like for us at this time. I don't know um, if Region 4 Mary Farnsworth has a little bit difference maybe, but um, I think we're all pretty much working from home. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Angel. I don't see any more questions up there. Um, there are, and, and I don't catch you, just go ahead and holler out. I'll, uh, I, I'm sitting in a bad place to see hands on the, on the screen. But anyway, uh, go ahead. Mrs. Farnsworth, are you there? Go ahead. I am you. here. Can you okay. hear me all right there? Yeah, welcome to our meeting. Go ahead when you're ready. Thank you so much. And, and uh, before I start my uh, formal comments here, in my formal comments, I do have uh, some information regarding the virus and, and what we're doing about that. So I uh, hope to address those as I go along here. But Chairman uh, Boner, Chairman Eklund, and members of the committee, good afternoon. I am Mary Farnsworth. I'm the acting regional forester for the Intermountain region of the Forest Service. Thank you for the opportunity to come before this committee. It's a pleasure to be here with my colleagues. And I really would like to thank uh, Bill Krapser for inviting me to today's briefing. Also joining me uh, as uh, region two uh, had folks on the, uh, on the video, so do I. Uh, I have Bridger Teton Forest Supervisor, Tricia O'Connor. Richard Teton, Deputy Forest Supervisor Kevin Kung, and Ashley Forest Supervisor Sue Eikhoff. And Sue is new to the region, so it's important that maybe uh, she say hi, I think, if she's on here, uh, or at least wave. Um, in Wyoming, the Intermountain region includes all our portions of four national forests in western Wyoming the Bridger Teton, the Caribou Targhee, Ashley, and the Uinta Wasatch Cache National Forests. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about work in Wyoming that's being done to sustain our nation's forests and grasslands and deliver benefits to the public. As you're aware, these are unprecedented times. And let me begin by saying that during the last 10 months of the pandemic, national forests have remained open, albeit with some developed recreation and fire restrictions in select areas for health and safety reasons. In spite of the virus, the Forest Service continues to manage national forests and grasslands for timber, range, minerals, outdoor rec opportunities, cultural and heritage resources, clean water and air, wildlife and fish, and special uses. We do a lot of things. Local Forest Service offices continue to operate through new and virtual approaches. This past year, for example, we offered online map sales, set up appointments with individuals who could only do business uh, conduct their business in person. And we offered free use firewood permits for those folks that were in, in need. We worked with grazing permittees to conduct vir virtual annual operating meetings in preparation for the upcoming grazing season. 
Timber sale purchasers continue to operate in several locations. Forest planning efforts continued on Ashley and road crews continue to grade forest roads. Trails, dispersed camping sites, boat ramps, marinas continue to be available for public use. Last year, many of our forests saw record use during this time as people, people went outdoors like never before. Uh, I'm sure you've heard some of that. Throughout the pandemic, our efforts have focused on ensuring the health and safety of our employees, their families, and most certainly the public, while also maintaining our ability to balance local economic needs. As a region, we continue to work closely with our state and local partners to collectively determine the best path forward. Our objectives remain very clear. We're gonna to continue to minimize and mitigate risks associated with the virus for our employees and families and the public while maintaining our ability to implement our mission. And uh, Tammy described uh, the chief's direction uh, very well. We will continue to remain nimble as we navigate the uncertainty and create more operational stability. We learned a ton this year. We'll, we'll, we're going to continue to support decision-making at the local level, the four soups and district rangers, and enable local line officers to work together with the communities they serve and they have a tremendous number of great relationships. So next, just as Jackie did, I'd like to give an update on the status of the region's forest products and fuels program. Pleased to report that in 2020, the region accomplished about 98% of its timber responsibilities. Annually, Wyoming's contribution to yearly timber accomplishments range from about seven to 10% of what's sold in the whole Intermountain region. So the timber sale program in the Intermountain region provides a relatively small, although critically important benefits to local communities and the national forests in Wyoming play a very important role in delivering those benefits. A couple of examples, uh, diving into a few details here. In fiscal year 2020, last year, the Bridger Teton successfully sold all offered sales, which amounted to an achievement of 107% of their assigned target. And the forest is on track to meet their assigned uh, responsibilities in 2021 as well. We often work across state lines and, and this came up a little earlier. You into Wasatch Cash, timber sales located in Utah were purchased by the South and Jones Timber Company and will be processed in their facility in Evanston. Um, and so, so sale in, in Utah goes over to Evanston uh, to, to uh, that mill. With respect to our fuels program, we also consistently exceed hazardous fuels targets. And again, much of that work is accomplished in Wyoming. We achieved over 100% of our assigned targets uh, in fuels from 2016 to 2019. Uh, so we did very well. However, in fiscal year 2020, in spite of the virus, folks did 132% of their assigned responsibilities, a dramatic uh, increase even though we were faced with the unexpected challenges due to the virus. As mentioned in previous testimony, one of those challenges included a pause in prescribed fire implementation uh, in order to protect our employees and the public uh, that might be further impacted by smoke produced through prescribed fire. And then early on in the, in the virus, uh, we were hearing, uh, you know, certainly air quality was affecting uh, uh, folks with the virus. Work around hazardous fuels reduction will continue to be a priority for the region now and into the future. Mitigating fire risk is critical. So as Jackie did, I'd like to talk a little bit about fire suppression and it continues to be a major priority for the agencies. We continue to experience record setting events and longer and longer fire seasons. Although we didn't experience uh, significant fire events on national forest system lands in Western Wyoming in the Intermountain region in 2020, our partners most certainly did. But we did have a, the Pilgrim Fire, which was 498 acres uh, started in, in late September. But we're committed to using all available tools and authorities for active management on fires. Mitigating risk in the urban interface remains a focus for the, the focus area for the agency and is an emphasis for the region as well. We continue to pre-position and mobilize initial response resources during times of increased lightning, elevated fire danger and events, or activities that may increase potential for human ignition. And that um, the last one, human ignition, is a big deal. 
um, as uh, State Forester Krapser mentioned, uh, human caused, I think he said uh, we're about 70% of the total emissions, and that's a very large number. With the influx of record numbers of recreationists enjoying the outdoors because of the virus, now's the time to enhance our fire prevention efforts. Increased collaboration and integrating our priorities with our partners will enable us to do the most good, thereby protecting communities, watersheds, and the economies where risks are greatest. So you've mentioned working with partners and, and working, uh, working with our partners, the Forest Service Restoration Work supports the growth and development of healthy ecosystems, vibrant, resilient communities. We continue to work with other federal agencies, state agencies, private landowners, communities, and American Indian tribes to help improve the health and resilience of the land. And I'd like to give you some specifics around that, examples of our partnership work. And it, it is extensive. These are only a couple of examples for you. Ongoing collaborative work with the Lincoln and Sublette County Collaborative Groups funded by Governor, Governor's Task Force Seed Money to identify future veg management opportunities in those counties. So uh, been working very tightly with them. This includes a planning effort with Sublette County Collaborative, BLM and Wyoming State Forestry to mitigate the effects of a significant blowdown event on the west side of the Wind River Range. The proposal may contain potential salvage harvest, fuels reduction and clearing of roads and trails. Another example is our cooperative work with Wyoming State Forestry to implement two timber sales in 2021 through the use of the Good Neighbor Agreements. This includes the Cow Camp Salvage Project on Pinedale uh, Ranger District and the Fire Trail Murphy Creek Project, Grays River Ranger District of the Ranger Teton. In addition, we continue to dialogue with cooperating agencies to complete alternative development release of the draft EIS for forest plan revision on the Ashley. We talked a little bit about forest plan revisions just a minute ago. That publication is expected to be made available to the public in late spring of 2021. Uh, the Ashley's been working very hard on that and, and Sue, the forest supervisor has been really working to, to coordinate uh, with local folks around that. The, fo the forest, uh, the Ashley also expects to begin planning efforts to develop an updated management plan for the Flaming Gorge National Recreation Area. This will be done in cooperation with the state of Wyoming and local governments in Sweetwater County. Another exciting effort includes development of shared stewardship projects with our state partners in Wyoming. And I'm really excited about that. And it's, it's taken some time for us to, to get there with shared stewardship, but. We're working together to identify shared priorities, pooling available resources in order to get our work done in areas where we have common interests. And that, that has a real op opportunity uh, looking forward. The National Forests in Wyoming provide many benefits to the people of the state and the, and the country. We recognize that there's much work to be done. We're going to continue to increase the pace and scale of forest management activities by working across jurisdictions leveraging partnership resources that result in healthy, diverse, and more resilient forests. Chairman, this concludes my prepared remarks, and I look forward uh, to a continued positive and, and productive working relationship with the state of Wyoming. And I'm really hoping that I have the opportunity to answer some of the questions that you asked Jackie, because uh, I have some thoughts in that arena as well. And, and so thank you so much for having me today, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Chairman Boner, go ahead. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll mix it up a little bit. I didn't get a chance to ask this uh, question in region two, but it's been on my mind. You, you mentioned uh, yet the fact that we're over 130% of the uh, targets for uh, timber harvest, and um, you know, that's it's really great, um, and certainly better than than anything less than that. But I was just wondering if you could go in a little bit more detail as to how who determines and how do you determine what that target actually um, is. Uh, just a little bit more discussion there, because I think I know that at least in the Black Hills, there's some uh, differences of opinion as to what, what the target should be. So just, just a little bit more background um, as to what that process is like and, uh, and anything else you feel might be relevant in uh, region four. Mr. Chairman, thanks for that. And Chairman Bonner, thanks for that question. So, so I'll give you a thumbnail. I'm not a guru on how all that comes down, but bottom line is it is assigned by our Washington office and it's based on, on funding and the funding kind of matches uh, 
the outputs that we should put out. And, and that's it in a nutshell, is you get so much money to produce X amount. <laughs> and so whether that's a timber volume, a uh, million board feet or, or, or CCF, um, or whether that's a fuels target, which is um, acres treated, uh, it's kind of the same thing. You get this amount of money to do this level of work. And as we've been talking about um, that desire to do more, um, I'd like to elaborate on that if I may. Um, so we get our, our appropriations and then we get some partnership dollars and, uh, and, and we're to do the uh, level of responsibility. To the extent that we can get as efficient as possible and we can share and, and work together uh, to get that work done as efficiently as possible, then that money stretches further. And that's the game we're in. Truly, that's the game we're in. Uh, because we get a finite amount of money from Congress to do our assigned work. If we have a partners that can, that can also uh, contribute some funds, um, or in, the, in, in many situations, working with the state through good neighbor authority agreements, um, the state often has uh, much speedier and more efficient contracting. Um, and it, it can happen faster, more efficient, and they have fewer rules that, that we have and are able then for say a timber sale contract, that sort of thing to get a better bid price. And so to that, to that end, where we can work together, um, we can make our dollar stretch further and then that allows us to do more work. And so, working um, collaboratively with formal collaborative groups or, or informal collaborative groups, working with the state, uh, our state partners, working with counties who have a, a, a big stake in the game and interests in what happens in their local communities to increase the level of our work. That's where we need to be. And we choose to do more. We're after that. That is the game that we are in, is trying to figure out how can we make our dollar stretch more and how can we work with partners to work in the right place at the right scale to get the work done and try to meet where we have those common interests? Um, it's a big deal. And a couple things to, to, to prime the pump on those efficiencies is we've recently um, been working on uh, the minimum bid price. And I'm not gonna explain this perfectly, but we have the ability to uh, uh, have a minimum government bid price of 25 cents for, for uh, material, that's almost free. And so then that allows, uh, say, a, a timber sale contract or multiple contractors to use the market to determine uh, what their bid prices would be instead of an arbitrarily high uh, minimum bid from the government. So these sorts of efficiencies can really help us to, to, make, um, to make it easier for folks to bid on sales, bid on product, um, pay for the transportation costs to get it somewhere, and those sorts of things. We've gone to 10 year con contracts in, in consultation with some of our industry partners that allows them to have some certainty in how long they can, they can um, play the markets as far as what they can sell uh, the material for. That helps them in, their, in what they need to do regarding the material that they're producing. Um, and so they can sit on a, a sale for a couple of years until the market's higher, go for it and make a buck versus uh, just being stuck in a real short time frame, And so that helps them in their business models. Um, and so uh, we've been doing those sorts of things to try to stretch our dollar just as far as it will go. Uh, but I can't emphasize uh, uh, that it's the partnerships that we have with the counties. Um, Sublet and Lincoln County are doing amazing work uh, in conjunction with the Bridger Teton. Um, and and uh, our work with uh, the state forester is just growing leaps and bounds. And as I think about shared stewardship, um, that's a relatively new new frame. And I think I heard someone early said, we hope these relationships can continue. They better, because we value them tremendously. And uh, I don't see that changing at all, given changes of administration, because shared stewardship is kind of a way of being. It's a way of, of working together and, and uh, uh, opening dialogue that perhaps hasn't been there in the past. And so where we have common interests, um, choose, choose to work together and find out where those common interests are and, 
That's where shared stewardship uh, really has opportunity going forward. Having conversations around uh, shared stewardship with timber sales, fuels treatment, but also with Department of Ag and, and, and other groups uh, as to what their interests are around invasive species and uh, what can we do together to treat uh, invasive weeds, those sorts of things. And, and, and with uh, uh, fish and game, uh, there's all sorts of places where we have common interests. And if we pool our resources, we can do so much more. And, I, and I'm, I'm kind of a big advocate. So hopefully that, that answered your question and I, I welcome more. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just follow up real quick, if that's okay. Yeah, good, Senator. Uh, yeah, thanks, appreciate that, and absolutely look forward to it. Yeah, there's lots of things we can uh, work together on. Hopefully, uh, politics back in that little, little area, back back in uh, um, in uh, on the Potomac, don't don't interfere with it too much. But um, uh, just to follow, so I understand that I, I, I'm coming from a place of uh, significant ignorance, coming from you know the <laughs> um, east side of the state and kind of the most thing we're familiar with when it comes to forest services, the grasslands up there. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the appropriation limiting your ability to process uh, um, or, or set these targets, I just, I, I guess in my mind, I think that you're selling something that the United States owns and that should provide revenue. Um, and the more you sell, the more you make. And so just a little bit more explanation for my part is to how that actually, how the appropriation is limiting, is it, yeah, is it for staff work? Is it for all the paperwork? Or how exactly is that limiting when there's a revenue source right there uh, that you can take advantage of? Uh, and the more you do, the more you, you make. Um, Mr. Chairman, thanks for the question. I'll try to answer it as succinctly as possible. Um, it, the most revenues, unless there's a, some sort of agreement that changes it, uh, most revenues, uh, say for a timber sale, go to the treasury. Okay. I'm sorry, what was that really? I, I didn't catch that. It goes where? It goes to the treasury. So, yes. so, so, so um, it's not a direct, if I in the Intermountain region sell something, um, I don't get to uh, then use it myself. It, it goes back. Very good. Okay. Um, they just want to make sure I understood uh, that, that part. Yeah. So, yeah. so part, part of some of uh, what's what what we have opportunity around is, is like the good neighbor authority and Bill, uh, state forester perhaps or mentioned this is there are some authorities that allow us um, to um, use uh, retained receipts and I'm not also using the right language necessarily I apologize but um, we. In, if we use certain authorities in certain agreements with, say, our state partners, there are ways that we can work together and keep those receipts so that we may use them on other projects or within that project area to get work done on the ground. But it's a special agreement and it, it takes a little more work up front, a little bit of a paper pushing thing. Um, but it does allow us some latitude then to use uh, those retained receipts locally. But it's kind of a special gig. Yeah, so Chairman Boner, it's kind of like our, our grazing lands at, at uh, um, oh, the National Guard grazing lands up at Camp Guernsey it goes into the general fund so you don't really see it as income and they can't, they have to be appropriated out of general fund dollars. So the forest service then doesn't really see how much money they make or do they? Okay. Um, chairman, uh, yeah. we tried to do it without just a head nod. I apologize for that. Um, we know what the proceeds are but then we need to turn them to the treasury and return them. Um, okay. Some of the proceeds, and, and I'm not a guru with this either, some of the proceeds go to states uh, payments and, and some of those sorts of things. So there's, it's a complex process, but for the most part, they go back to the treasury. We know how much it is, but then it goes. Thank you. So we know how much we, for example, on a timber sale, we would know what the, the bids are and we would know how much is pulled out for mandatory reforestation, those sorts of things. And then we send it off. All right. In, well, in a nutshell, that's oversimplification, but 
best I can do. Okay, we've got a question from Representative Heiner. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Eklund, appreciate that. Actually, I've got a couple of questions on a variety of topics for Ms. Farnsworth, but one of them is a follow-up to what she just said. Those pro proceeds go back to the treasury, but does do some of the portion of those proceeds then come back to the state of Wyoming? Okay, very good. So the more yeah. timber sales we have, the more revenue the state of Wyoming receives. Well, um, I'm gonna try to answer that. Um, so the rule, as I understand it, and I might ask some of my partners here to help me, especially uh, Jackie, um, but, but, but the Forest Service is required to give back a, a certain percentage of all proceeds uh, to states is my belief. That's, I think that's how that works. And uh, thanks, Jackie. Um, and I think it is a little misconception, at least in other duty locations where I have worked, that the timber sales is where those proceeds come from that, that go into the state funds. Um, in many of my uh, experiences in the past, and I think it, it's in play in, in the Intermountain region now as well, is the, most of the proceeds are not coming from timber sales, nor have they for many, many, many years. Um, it comes from other proceeds, um, like uh, summer home fees and, uh, and other uh, revenue that the Forest Service brings in. And so, yes, it is true that a portion of, of the timber sale funds uh, come from, go back to states. Uh, it is a very small percentage, and there's a calculation between HILT and the 25% and, and uh, rural schools. There, there's some formulas that go down there. So, so um, it's important to realize that it comes from a, a suite of revenue sources, not just timber sales. And the timber sale proportion is very small compared to some of the other areas where we uh, receive revenues. Chairman, another question, yes. if I may. Go ahead, Representative Heiner. So uh, Ms. Farnsworth mentioned a, a couple of timber sales that are happening in 2021. And the one in Murphy Creek has been talked about for many years by the, by the uh, county commissioners. So on, on an average, gen just generally, how long does it take to be, once a, a timber potential timber sale has been identified, how long does it take to get to where there's equipment on the ground and it actually comes to fruition? And are you satisfied with that time period uh, or are you trying to work that uh, into a shortened cycle? Mr. Chairman and Representative Heiner, I'll try to answer that. Now that, that was a premier run on question. I loved it. Um, the um, our, uh, so NEPA takes a while. We we have been working on um, I, and I'm not familiar with that specific timber sale that you mentioned, but let me address it broadly and, and see how we do there. Um, am I satisfied with the time it takes to do our environmental compliance work? No, I'm not. Um, but I gotta say that we have made immense uh, progress on getting that work done more efficiently in the past three years than I've ever been, than, than the rest of my whole career of 30 plus years. Um, we have really, with laser focus, really jammed on that uh, to find efficiencies. And now we're in a place where we've, we've been re kind of training our folks to, to analyze the right information at the right level, um, the right landscapes, um, for the right reasons, um, not just more. And for a while there, we were just doing more, <laughs> more analysis, um, thinking that that was a solution to some of, some of the challenges that we face. If we're facing litigation, just more must be the answer. And it's not, <laughs> it's not the answer. So we have uh, reduced the time it takes. We have new authorities, um, the Farm Bill authorities, new categorical exclusions that allow us to do say a timber sale less than I think 2,500 acres, um, super speedy. And we used to do EAs, EISs for things that are 2,500 acres. Uh, now we do have authorities where we can use categorical exclusions and be far more efficient with our work. Categorical exclusion does the analysis, but it speeds up the process. Um, we have very, uh, very focused environmental assessments 
that uh, are not 300 pages, they're, they're more like 60. And, and so if we can shorten and, and, and get the right information, uh, don't shortcut our analysis, but get it right, um, we can absolutely sh uh, shorten the time period it takes to get our work done. And that is our goal. And that's what we've been working on. And, and uh, we've really become far more efficient. And I, I can't quote you the percentage, but last I heard it was upwards of 20% more efficient in getting our NEPA projects from day one uh, to, to, to the end of the analysis. Now, the second piece of your question is a fascinating one because you speak of the environmental analysis and then you said, dozers on the ground. And that's a different thing because we might sell a sale and a timber company who bought that sale might sit on it for three years because of market conditions. Okay? So we might have a project where we did NEPA way back, but it's still hanging out there not being completed yet because the purchaser is choosing to play the markets to ensure that he has a market for his end product. So it might stay on the stump for a while. Um, so there's all sorts of, 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 of um, things that happen. And so, some people say, well, hey, how come there's a dozer out there? You didn't do NEPA. Well, we did. It was just a while back. So that's w one thing that happens to us. Um, another is, is um, we often do grant extensions to timber sale companies because the markets are really cruddy. And, and we do do that uh, relatively routinely uh, to try to help industry with the market conditions that just happen to them as well. So we try to work very closely with industry. I hope that hopefully that answers it. Uh, we continue to work on, on how tight our environmental analysis is and doing the right stuff um, versus more. The, the more scenarios in, in that case, not working so well for us, it needs to be tight. Hey, thank you. We have representative Sweeney in our ag meeting. Welcome to the meeting, Patrick. Go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so my question is, uh, our partners with, with the Forest Service, um, how do you see your role uh, in relationship to our elk feed grounds in, in this process? Um, because uh, that's a very important issue uh, to our uh, ranching community um, and our hunting community. And we've kind of created a legacy, but um, I, I'd be interested what your relation, what you feel your relationship is in this whole process um, as, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and Representative Sweeney, it, it, I, I smile a little bit there because we're working tight with uh, the Wyoming uh, Game and Fish. We're working very tight. Um, and I, I view our relationship as one of a, a, a tight partner. Um, I understand the, the, the long tenure of those feed grounds. Um, right now we are in litigation, so, so I, it's a little hard to talk too much about nitty gritty, but those feed grounds have, have some dilemmas um, and it is very complex. And in general, you know, disease transmission with the chronic wasting disease right now with the first case being uh, found up there in the park, um, I, I believe, and, and, uh, and then the, the concern around brucellosis. And so, um, there's concerns in general with congregating elk in, in one place, and, and that's kind of some dilemmas there. Uh, but your question specifically is how do how do I see our, our relationship? And I see it as an extremely tight partner uh, with Game and Fish, and there are other partners with the park um, and the, the uh, wildlife refuge there as well. Uh, but we're working very closely with. Uh, game and fish regarding the lawsuit and uh, where we go from here. Hopefully I answered that question, but it, uh, I'm not able to say a ton because of the litigation, I apologize. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Mr. Chairman, follow up. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Representative Sweeney. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, I think you dodged the bullet quite well, um, <laughs> but 
um, I um, am uh, very concerned mm -hmm. uh, in this process uh, that's, in my opinion, being pushed by environmentalist groups. Um, and just my opinion, but so what happens if you do close the national forests off, off to the state of Wyoming? And let's say there is a state section that we could move to, but you possibly could block uh, the move uh, to the state of Wyoming. Is that a feasible or possible scenario that could happen to us? Just your opinion, so. Yeah, so, so let me undodge a bullet a little bit. And because uh, I, I, I had a thought, my two brain cells uh, hit each other right there. And then I'll try to get to your second, the second piece. So our intention is, is to authorize uh, the use of, of what's currently right now, um, uh, two of the feed grounds that, that, are, that are struggling with a lawsuit. Our intention is to do NEPA, um, go through a decision-making process, a uh, full range of alternatives of, of what that could look like um, in order to get through the process. And we're working, we're working on that as we speak. And the state uh, is, is a partner in that, and they've already begun having conversations around chronic wasting disease with the public uh, towards this effort. Um, and so we're working together to, to uh, seek a path forward uh, so that what you described as far as not being authorized uh, doesn't happen. Um, so we're working through that. Um, I don't understand your second question of us blocking uh, the purchase or the movement of elk onto a state-owned parcel. Um, I, I apologize for that. Can you, can you restate your question a little bit? I think he, he might be talking about access to get to, the, to feed elk in a state property that is surrounded by federal property, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, my impression, not knowing any specifics whatsoever, so I'll caveat it with that. But my impression is is uh, that's an access issue, not a to feed or not to feed issue. Okay. You okay, Representative Sweeney. I'm always great when I come to Ag Committee. Thanks. Thank All right. So so good to see you. We have another question from Representative Heiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for all of the questions I'm I'm posing out there. But I ha we have such a great uh, group of people here. I just I just can hardly contain myself with all the questions I have and and the topics we have to discuss here are, are interesting to me, but. I, I won't. I won't ask any more about timber sales, but the uh, our, our our executive officer of the state of Wyoming just signed a bill this week uh, concerning invasive species. Uh, it's one of his focal points for the state of Wyoming, and we passed a legislation this past week through through our our House and Senate to give our local weed and pest districts more authority to respond to the invasive species throughout the state. But in their testimony, we heard last week, there a couple of times it came up that they were trying to fight these in, the invasive species, but the, the federal lands, the federal departments were slow to respond. And they were, so they, they felt like they were losing the battle because just over the fence, nothing was happening and, and they're trying to do everything on, on the state lands that they could, but weren't getting support from the, from the federal departments. Is, is there anything that we could do to help with that effort so that we can effectively combat the invasive species in Wyoming? Mr. Chairman and Representative Hinder, I'm really glad to ask that question. Um, I think there's a ton more we can do around invasive species. And the dialogue we're having um, with uh, the governor's office, Joe Budd, around uh, where we might really lean into shared stewardship opportunities 
where we have mutual interests that we got to do something and we need to do it quickly and efficiently. Um, invasive species is at the top of the list. And we, we've kind of been um, dabbling back and forth. Is it, is it timber? Is it fuels? Is it invasive species? What, what effort do we really need to lean into first and foremost? And um, uh, Jackie and I's conversation uh, with Joe has been around, yeah, invasive species is just a place that we really need to work on. And I think those dialogues can really help um, us to maybe get off the dime a little faster. Um, and, but the partnership is where it's going to be. It's going to be how can we really join up? Where are we treating? So that there's not that fence line and, you know, the state does some treatments, and private land, and then us feds, we're not able to get to it. And they're, uh, you know, they're next to each other. That doesn't work with invasive species at all. So, so I look forward to that opportunity. That's an area where I think we could just uh, jam right along. And, and I think this shared stewardship concept of us really focusing in where we have mutual interests is that route where we can really bring partners to the table, the state, the Forest Service um, across the state of Wyoming and really make some hay. Thank you. That's good to hear. Um, a question, I'm not seeing any more hands going up, a question I'd have. So must have been about a half a dozen years ago. Um, our, our grazing permittees were required to turn in a NEPA uh, report of some type to get their trail permits. Are you aware of that and how that's gone? Um, Anyway, kind of threw everybody into a quandary. It had been about a legis legislative time that we started hearing about this requirement for NEPA evaluations before they could have their trail permits. Did they find an expedited process or, or is it a one-time process that, that the permittees needed to have? Do you know much about this? Mr. Chairman, I don't. Um, I would look at my friend Jackie to see if uh, she might have some recollection of, of uh, what that might be. Chairman, if I may? Yeah, go ahead, okay. Ms. Buchanan. Um, sir and, and committee members, um, it is. it should be a one-time thing that you go through to, for the trailing. And part of the range... Um, work that, that we spoke to earlier of the range directives and the updates, uh, there is a trailing component in that uh, to speak to about being able to, to trail livestock. And, and so, uh, but once you get through it, it's not something that you should have to do, you know, repetitively unless you have a change for where you, how you want to trail. But um, part of those new range directives will um, hopefully address even making it a, a bit easier uh, to, to deal with that. Thank you. That's, that's good news. We, when we first heard about it, we didn't know if they would have to do this annually or how it was going to be set up. Okay. And I haven't been on the ag committee for a while, so I have, hadn't heard much recently. So uh, Katie, do we have any other people from the public that are in the waiting room? Okay. Committee, I believe you're done. Oh, Joe Bud uh, oh, wants to say something. Looks like. Hey, oh, we've got somebody. Joe Bud, welcome to our meeting. Go ahead when you're hooked in and ready. You might be muted. We we don't see you or hear you. There you go. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, lots of great discussion today. I think I I just wanted to make sure that I was on here so that um, knowing that we have some new members, if there was any specific questions for us. But um, if I could share a few things uh, quickly, I would I would do that, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Go ahead. Um, I, like I said, I think there's a lot of great discussion. I I think. Uh, Kind of to the end that we we typically end up talking about timber and fire and then uh, move into a lot of other stuff and uh, the invasives question that just came up from representative heiner 
Uh, the Forest Service was an active member on GS, GISI, the, the Governor's Invasive Species Initiative. And um, we've really worked with both the regions to get some of the NEPA done so they can do aerial spraying and things. So I, I think we're moving in a great direction there. Um, but outside of kind of the, the timber and fire world, um, our partnership with the Forest Service is, it, it's really kind of all over the place. We've uh, prairie dogs on Thunder Basin, uh, coal on Thunder Basin, we do endangered species. Uh, Bighorn National Forest has a steering committee and, and Andrew Johnson, uh, the supervisor up there probably recognizes the, the wood over my shoulder. Um, uh, you know, mention the Sublette County uh, and Lincoln County initiatives. Those are, those are huge. Uh, we overlap on recreation. A lot of water for our municipalities comes off the forest. So there are tons of issues that we partner with the Forest Service on, um, all the way to things like ski resorts. So uh, really, they've been a, a great partner. And, and from my time, my previous experience at Wyoming Department of Ag, <clears throat> I can tell you that um, Wyoming has a pretty enviable relationship compared to some of the other states with the Forest Service. Um, so I, I feel really good there. Um, Shared stewardship is, is going to be a really big thing. And Forrester Crapser mentioned uh, the document earlier, and, and it was signed between Secretary Purdue and the governor. And uh, I've, I've updated this committee in the past, but with new members, if you'd like some information on that, I'd be happy to send it over. Um, and uh, Majority Floor Leader Summers um, rep, rep, or, uh, referred to the grazing regulation reforms. And again, I think those are encouraging changes and one that the governor's office will comment on as well as a number of our agencies. Uh, in that realm, it's worth noting that the chief of the forest service doesn't usually change. And so not that we're hanging our hat on that or uh, I, I think Bill Sack has been um, nominated for USDA who that's kind of a known quantity. Um, Again, not really hanging our hat on it, but I think that that gives us some optimism that, that thing will go forward. Uh, the NEPA reform stuff also mentioned uh, by Representative Summers. Again, that, that would be a huge win for everyone involved. I think maybe two major examples out of that would be the ability for the Forest Service to do determinations in NEPA adequacy um, like the BLM does, which would significantly cut down project times in, in some areas. Um, it would also expand their ability to do categorical exclusions, which would be a, a huge win uh, and, and cut down on that too. So we, uh, in that realm, we're updating our NEPA MOU with the Forest Service, which uh, again recognizes a lot of the work that our agencies have done with them in the past um, and, and keeps us in those discussions. So again, Mr. Chairman, overall, uh, we have some challenges in both regions and, and they're unique to each region. Uh, but the Forest Service has been really great about coming to the table and trying to figure that out. Uh, I, I think we maintain a good working relationship, uh, even even when we disagree on stuff. So just wanted to, to throw a couple things out there for the committee. And, and if there's any big questions uh, for the governor's office, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Thank you, sir. We do have a question here. Uh, Representative Fortner. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think it's worth noting that uh, in the war on weeds that, that I've been fighting for 20 years and I sprayed from Colorado to Montana, up into Montana, uh, all across the red desert region. And uh, the, the broken link in, in the, the, weed on, the war on weeds is the state of Wyoming. Uh, if you get your pups and pesticide use proposals in, uh, in time to the to the national grasslands, the BLM, and others that's under federal national forest, uh, that goes relatively smooth. Uh, the state of Wyoming, however, from time to time, more often than not, has drugged their feet on their their portion of the, the weed program. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Fortner. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I could follow up a little bit. Um, Go ahead, Mr. Rep Bud. Representative Fortner, I, I think uh, that's an ongoing challenge, but I, I think the legislation that was just passed in the bill that the governor just signed um, in conjunction with good neighbor agreements and our shared stewardship agreements are really gonna move that ball forward. So um, I'm again, I'm, I'm optimistic in that realm. Thank you. We are too. We're hoping that that initiative changes how the state is able to respond. 
So any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Budd. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Now, I'm not sure whether we have anyone else in the waiting room. I'm wondering if Mr. Krapser had anything he wanted to add before we adjourn the meeting or anyone else. Mr. Mr. Chairman, all I would have to add, we've, we've used up uh, your two hours of your time. We appreciate the, uh, the support that the uh, committee has given both state forestry and the uh, um, forest service over time. Uh, we appreciate your questions and your attention today. And, and once again, I, I want to thank Representative Blackburn for representing trees with the background he had. <laughs> uh, I am, and, and thank our federal partners for appearing with me today. And as always, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, you all have my phone number. Don't ever hesitate to call us and ask us anything we're doing on forestry or fire or uh, any concerns you have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for our service and thanks member of the committee. Thank you everybody for your testimony and the education that we got today. We appreciate it. So I don't see any hands raised and it looks like our business is done. Thank you committee. Um, we are now adjourned. I thought we were going till five. What's that? I thought we were going till five. Okay, You're I not guess wrong. the rest of us are adjourned now and, and Representative Blackburn can stay till five. Well, I'm, that's 